All right, you guys ready, man? We're going to get in the Word today. I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to get fired up. Because I'm on one of my favorite subjects. When Chris said he was doing a series on David, my heart said, oh my. I've been studying David's life for the last five years. Every cop I disciple, which I have a number of them on a weekly basis, I take them through the life of David because it has every major theme there is. And so I love David. You know, when he said that, I'm like, oh, somebody help me. So I'd like to start out with a couple of verses that mean a lot to me. We can throw that first verse up. You know, when I look at the word, I find it interesting to me. It says in Hebrews 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, what, what would that have to do with reading about the life of David? Why would that matter? Whatever he did once upon a time, he'll do it again. The way he treated somebody once upon a time, he'll do it again. The other verse I think is important is right here. When Remember, we have the next, next verse. When we got out of here, we have, the scenario is, is we have Peter, who takes the first Gentile, <laughs> okay? And we have the first Gentile as a centurion, a man of war, and he sends away because he wants to know more about God, and suddenly Peter says this, is a Jew looking at a Gentile, seeing the Spirit of God being poured upon him, he says, then Peter began to speak. I now realize it is true that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. So if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he's no respecter of persons, what does that mean? That means when I study the characters here, this David ain't God, God's pet. David is a man who lived in a certain way or had certain things that we want, we've been looking at that won God's favor simply by his actions and his choices. And that same opportunity is available for every one of us. And so I want to challenge you today with some thoughts here that I think really, really encourage me. You know, we're looking at that David is a warrior poet. When in my world here of law enforcement, which... Their warriors, Chesterton said that the true warrior fights not because he hates what's in front of him, because he loves what's behind him. Yeah. That someone in love does not let somebody abuse him. Someone in love does not let a legal activity or a loss of life happen. Someone in love stands there and says, not on my watch, I'll defend the defenseless. Yeah. But I want you to look at what it says about David. 2 Samuel 17, 8 through 10. This is Erethabel giving advice to Solomon, or not Solomon, but... Um, Absalom. Absalom has a rebellion. And I want you to listen to the description of David here. You know your father and his men, okay? He wants to kill his father. He said they're fighters and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Beside your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now he is hidden in a cave or some other place. And if he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, there's been a slaughter among the troops of, who follow Absalom. Then, even the bravest soldier, whose heart's like the heart of a lion, will melt with fear, for all Israel knows that your father's a fighter and those who are with him are brave. If you're a red-blooded male, that touches something down inside you. A man who is wild, like a wild bear robbed of her cubs. You ever seen a mama bear? <laughs> Don't mess with mama bears. And he was such a wild fighter that if he should take the initiative, everybody's going to melt down because they cut loose. He cut loose. But yet, we look at this. He's mentioned over a thousand times in Scripture, over 1,100 times this warrior is. And we look what God had to say about him, Acts 13, 22. Acts 13, 22, Paul recounting this says, And after removing Saul, he made David their king, and God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Do you want to know what God's heart is? Here's a man who's going to tell you what God's heart is. Here's a man who's going to reveal insight because heart touches heart. And there's something that this guy lived out. Now, let me ask you this. For those who know the Bible, did he not commit adultery? Was somebody named Bathsheba? Did he not have her husband killed because he couldn't get him drunk to go sleep with his wife so he could cover up? Did he not take a census where there's 70,000 people died? 
Did he not have eight wives and ten concubines? Oh my goodness. What would the average church say about that? <laughs> now, before you get excited about an opportunity here, just hold on, okay, because we're not to the rest of the story. But my point is right now is this. There's something that I think that God looks for at times that we miss. I think there's something more precious that God has that he wants to see out of humanity than sometimes we look at, because we look in the outward, Chris was talking last time about the outward versus the inward. You know, I just love this looking at it. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. This is the firstborn of Jesse who came before him, because he thought, surely this is God's anointed. And he says, Don't look at his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. He said, The Lord does not look in the things man looks at. The Lord looks on the, or man looks in the outward appearance. The Lord looks where? He looks on the heart. And so we talked about it. Chris talked about that. And I'd like to just uh, shed a couple, another little uh, facet of light on that diamond. It's interesting the words used there. God's heart in, in Acts 13, 22 is cardia, right? Imagine that, cardio, <laughs> right? What's significant about your physical heart? It is the most vital thing there is. I mean, when you officially die by a lack of oxygen because your heart quit working or it quit being efficient. And so at the core of a man is a heart. The core of the heart is the core of every lungs, the core of every arm, leg, everything else is a heart that's pumping out life. It's pumping out life. And God says, you're touching my heart. You're touching the things that I have such a passion for. You're touching something deep down inside of me. When it comes to the word used in the Hebrew there, it's levav. It means the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, the soul, the understanding. God says, you know what? You want to see what really touches me? You show me a man and his mind, what he thinks about. You show me in his will and what he chooses to do. You show me in his heart and what it is toward his fellow man. You show me his soul and you show me his understanding. And you show me that. And I'm going to show you an example here of something that touched my heart by this man and the way he processed life. And so when we look at that, there's a parallel passage that I don't think we ever think about. I think it illustrates this principle, just to make a short point here. Next, next one here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to show you. So many times for me, I miss stuff. I miss obvious things, and God ministers to me. I'm like, oh my goodness, I couldn't. You know, it's like a V8 moment. <laughs> and so by the grace God has given me, Paul said, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should be built with care. What's important about foundations? They support everything, all the other efforts, okay? Sort of like the heart, right? <laughs> Nothing else works without it. Foundation determines the shape of the building, determines how high it's going to go, determines if it's going to stand the test of time, it determines what it's going to weather the storms. For no one can lay any other foundation other than the one that's already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. God in his heart gave his very best so that we could have a fighting start. But I want you to look at this. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hair, straw, notice the building materials there. You got that down? Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Next slide. If what he has built survives, the, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though it was one escaping through the flames. So imagine you're out here, okay? You've got a sure foundation, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but he says, we're going to give you an option of smorgasbord of building materials, folks. you got wood, hay, and straw, and you have gold, silver, and precious stones. And the way we're going to test this whole party here was with fire. So out of those six ingredients, which one will still be there when fire's done? Precious stones, gold and silver. Now, it may be melted, but they're still there, right? Okay, wood, hay, and straw. Now, I think the simple illustration we mess sometimes is where do I find wood, hay, and straw? Visible or is it underground where I don't see it? It's visible. Where do I find gold, silver, and precious stones? They're just laying around? No, I got to dig for them. There's times I come up empty. There's times I got to sweat. There's times I got to sit here and seek. I got to have a hunch. I'm not giving up. I persevere. 
And I think that's the illustration. The illustration gets me is, yeah, you can be in America and you can have nice, flowery whatever, okay? But God ain't looking at that. He's looking on your heart. He's looking to have you sit there and let him refine you so you can have the gold. Have you let him refine you so you can have the silver? Have you let him work in your life in such a way that you can have something precious that's going to stand the fire when it's all over with? Have you let him take and work in your life so you can have eternal fruit that endures? And that's what he's talking about. And so we get back to the story here. I'd like to share with you a tale of two hearts. (laughs) The heart of Saul... And the heart of David for a contrast. So let's look at the outward fruit, the wood, hay, and straw on one side, right? So if I look at this, I can give you an example here in 1 Samuel 9 2. Saul had a son named Saul, or he had a son named Saul, Kish did, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. So he looked good, right? <laughs> looked good on the outside. He had that presidential look, that kingship look, right? Well, guess what? David in 1 Samuel 16, 12 said he sent for him and he was ruddy with fine appearance and handsome uh, features. So David was a good looking young man too. You can turn around and look at positions and responsibility. The whole story in 1 Samuel 9, and I share this to go back with your families and study it. 1 Samuel 9, Kish loses his donkeys. He says to his son, Saul, he said, go find the donkeys. So he goes to one region, Shalom or whatever, and he can't find them. He goes to the next region and can't find them. He goes to the next region and can't find them. He finally gets to the point where they don't know where to go anymore. And suddenly his young servant there says, let's go talk to the man of God. He said, we don't have any offerings to bring him. He said, I got some silver. I'll let you borrow it, boss. (laughs) So they go to the priest there. And, and in the middle of that discussion, he says, we don't have any food to give him or anything else. So here's a guy who was responsible, went out there to the point of having no food, searching, trying to get the mission done. He was doing good, right? We look at David. David did what? He went out and he was a servant. He went out there and took care of the sheep. He's faithful with them. The lions attacked him. He killed them. The bears attacked him. He killed them. David was out there faithful as well. They were both brave in battle. We know David in the story of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. He ran to the battle lines. One of the things I love about David, you always see him run into the battle lines. He didn't walk, he didn't try it, he didn't have it. He's like, oh, it's on, baby. It says in 1 Samuel 18, 5, that whenever Saul sent him to do, David did successfully, so that Saul gave him a high rank in the army, and this pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. He lived in such a way as a warrior that people, he commanded respect. They let him be the leader. They want him to be because he led them in victory. You can see the same thing in Saul, at least starting out. He rescued, uh, rescued Jabesh Gilead in 1 Samuel 11. So here they were. They said, yay, we captured this group of people, Israelites, and we're going to make a deal with you. We want to poke your eyes out. <laughs> we're going to poke one of your eyes out, and you can be subject to us. Could you, what do you think about that? Well, let me get right back with you. <laughs> so he went back and talked to Saul. Saul gets incense. The Spirit of God fell on him, it says, and he went out there and tore him up. With Jonathan's help in 1 Samuel 14, he, def- he defeated the Philistines. So he went there. But then God gave him an assignment. God said, I want you to take out the Amalekites. The Amalekites are an evil people. They're out here raiding people and doing all kinds of stuff. I want you to get totally rid of them. And so what does he do? He goes out, he fights them conquers them, and all of a sudden he starts looking, and man, they got some pretty fine livestock there. They got some pretty fine horses there. And so, you know, I'm on a mission for God. I'm going to keep back, even though God told me to get rid of this stuff and totally destroy it. And so he kept back parts for himself. And guess what happened to him? Here's a thumbnail sketch of a man with victory, a man with power. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and met with Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he set up a monument in his own honor. You want to test her a man or a woman, see within her heart, give them power. You want to test a man or woman and, and give them prestige. The Bible says a man's tested by the praise he receives. It's kind of like humility. The minute you say you have it, you, you, you lost it. You don't touch the things of God. If anything good's happened in my life, it's because of a gracious God and a godly wife and wonderful kids who are forgiving. I have nothing to give him. Matter of fact, I tremble because, you know, it's all great. We love the outward sign. Yeah, put a man in power. 
But do you love the responsibility? Do you love the fact that you're going to stand before a holy God someday and give an account for 2,300 people and a mystery to 100,000 cops? That drives me to my face. That terrifies me. It makes me cry out to God like never before in my life. It's causing me to grow in areas I don't want to grow in. I have to watch my mouth. I've been free with my mouth because I'm a blue-collar guy. Well, dude, you're done. If you won't purify yourself, then let God do it for you. And so now I trip up on a word and I destroy a whole relationship. I trip on a word that can mess up a whole nation. And I am, I am broken. But it's not my life, it's his. And so when we look at this, I would like to, I would like to share with you seven attributes that I see in David's life that I think give him a man after God's own heart. Because the unfortunate thing about Saul is he got rejected. He got rejected because at the end of the day, once given assignments by God to do, and once given victory, he took the glory for himself, and he decided he was going to choose to do what he wanted to do and offer unauthorized sacrifice and do a number of things that caused him to be rejected by God. But conversely, we have David. I think the first thing I look at is he proved that God was at the center of his life. See, we can talk a mean game on the outside because it's easy in America. All I got to do is be better than the next guy beside me, right? Thank God I'm not like those crazy pagans, all those fairies or those weirdos, all those Democrats. <laughs> See, it's easy for us, man. But I'm here to tell you right now, God might have put it all in place just to reveal your heart. Because God offends your mind to reveal your heart. I had a prophet tell me that one time. God offends your mind to reveal your heart. And my response can be just as ungodly as whatever the initial thing was. So here we have, the first thing I have is he honored those who God had put over him. He refuses revenge. He spent 15 years, from what I read, at least, of being hunted by his boss, the king. The king was jealous of him. He hurled spears at him on two different times, 1 Samuel 18, 11, and 19, 9 through 17. He got so upset and hated, he tried to pin David to the wall. He tried to get him killed by a Philistine foreskin scheme. <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you my wife the problem child. <laughs> she gets done with him, he's going to be destroyed, but if that don't work out, I just need 100 Philistine foreskins. And so David gets 200. <laughs> overachiever he lies repeatedly he restores things to david says oh you're the lord's anointed i'm not going to do anything but next thing you know he's trying to kill him again but yet david has two chances to kill him he has two chances to take him off one saul's relieving himself in the cave right so david's hiding in the cave he comes into whatever and drain the whatever and all that stuff <laughs> and he's in there and david's right there and he could have come up there and slit his throat Instead, he cuts a corner off his robe and he waits till he leaves and says, hey, boss, I could have took your life. Another time it happens when they sneak in there and uh, him and Abishai sneak into the camp. They find him sleeping. God puts him in a deep sleep. They've got to run a spear right through him like Abishai wanted to. He said, no, I ain't touching the Lord's anointed. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting too is when he killed the Amalekite that came to him in 2 Samuel chapter 1. So here's a guy thinking he's going to get a reward, right? <laughs> Hey, boss, I bought you this, this. So, you know, I went and killed Saul <laughs> when Saul killed himself. But he's trying to get a reward, and guess what? It cost him his life, all because David honored the position because he said, I didn't put him there. God put him there. And you're messing with God's anointed. And I think the challenge for me and every one of us is whether you like it or not, God puts people in high places. And that's a hard one for me to stomach. Now, does that mean we just have carnival black, whatever? No, it's not it. That means we turn around and we got to be very careful here that we walk listening to God and what he tells us because in America, we're a little different than kings. We have we the people. But the point simply gets me at the end of the day, he's not upset because so-and-so is in office. He may allow that to help us to get to where we need to be so he can bring real solutions. But the thing is, how many times do we hold grudges? How many times do we seek revenge for those who have hurt us? 
And so I see David's life challenging my life to say, what, are you really, do you, have, do you have anything in your life where someone's hurt you in the past where you just won't let go of it? Do you have anything in your life where you'd love to just get your pound of flesh? Or can you do like it says, and put up that verse here. Proverbs uh, 19, 11. Proverbs 19, 7, 11 says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's the one's glory to overlook an offense. I always tell cops, uh, what's that nomenclature for a 45, Bob? Where's Bob? Bob is not here. Oh, there he is. What's the nomenclature? The nomenclature for 19, well, I just told you, 1911. (laughs) I can't even ask a question right. So a 45 caliber handgun in the military world is a 1911. So that's Proverbs 19.11. So I tell cops all the time, that's 19.11. That's, that's what you pull out when people abuse you. Now, I got to use that myself here not too long ago. My family was there. <laughs> and uh, it's, hard, it's a hard one, but it works. And so you look at this thing about letting go of stuff. If, if you holding grudges and desiring revenge is like, it's going to eat your life away. If you want to honor God, then let go of it. If you got stuff in your life, let go of it. The second thing I see is he embraced the hardships that God allowed him to go through. He lived in caves and was forced to live with his enemies at times. I've so come to appreciate here lately that hardships are a gift from God. I'm president of the International Conference of Police Chaplains because God has taken me on a journey that I misinterpreted most of my life. We had nine wonderful children, but they were very expensive. <laughs> and so I worked in construction, making $43,000 a year. And if you want to raise a family of 11 on $43,000, that's a, that's a great lesson. We struggled. We struggled financially like crazy, and I thought, God doesn't care about me. But he turned around, and we built a house, custom house for a guy who took a liking to me, has a dream in the middle of the night, he makes me in charge of his nonprofit organization, and suddenly I start getting skills that I'm not going to appreciate until some way down the road. I got falsely accused of something. I reminded somebody of their ex-husband. <laughs> and next thing you know, that went south, and I went through a hard trial there where I just felt like I didn't want to live anymore because that was taken away from me. It was the only thing I did other than construction. But in the middle of that, God stripped me down to the foundation because it was performance-based acceptance. I love my dad, but he always told me I'd be worthless and never amount to anything. That's a hard sentence. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I I have all the mercy in the world because I I understand him and I feel bad for him. He's with Jesus now, so he understands too. You know, you can look out here and see all the stuff you've been through, but I'm here to tell you, guess what? That gave me a set of skills. And one thing led to another. This appreciation day worked to the point where we had a nationwide platform. I ended up on the board of directors for the Fellowship of Christian Peace Officers USA. I spent six years on the board of directors in a nationwide sense there. That taught me more skills. And then this skill led to that skill, led to this, led to that, and suddenly here I am. And why am I here? I'm here because every hardship, every trial, every tribulation, every bit of junk was working for my good because all things work for the good of those that love him called according to his name. Not only do we rejoice in our suffering because we know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. We have the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. That in the middle of your trials, tribulations, Judges chapter 3, these are the nations the Lord left to test the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. He did this only to teach warfare to the next generation. God let them practice on enemies so they could get good. God let you practice on hardship so you can get good. If you want to be compassionate, go through hell and then have a compassion for those going to hell. If you want to sit here and struggle, struggle like crazy and have compassion on someone coming alongside you who's having a hard time making ends meet. A lot of you have been through a lot of stuff, but I'm here to tell you right now, God's forging you into something if you can rejoice in the storm, if you can turn around and trust him with your life. So whatever's coming down your way, I'm telling you, no matter how hard it is, he promised if you love him to redeem it for your good. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. It says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children, or as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their father. My job with every one of those kids is to say, either do what daddy says, or daddy gives you a set of consequences that make you wish you did what I said. <laughs> Now, if I'm consistent, what do they learn? They learn self-control. 
They learn to evaluate their performance and, and hopefully in a biblical standard that I'm holding before them. Eventually, as they grow up, just like my two-year-old would put a fork in the, in the electric thing, <laughs> when they're 20, I don't have to warn them anymore. <laughs> because they understand if they live, because I kept a good eye on them, if they live, they understand the relationship. And so it's the same way. Every one of God's commands are really based up in what? It's relationship. All the commandments in Romans 13, verse 8, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbors yourself. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of law. I've come to discover that everything I thought God was keeping me from fun was really teaching me how to love. Teach me how to care about other people. We look at the third thing. As I think this is amazing, this one challenges me more than anything. He sought the Lord for every decision. 1 Samuel 23, 2, in regard to saving Keelah and the Philistines, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? 1 Samuel 23, 4 and 5, once again, David inquired of the Lord. 1 Samuel 30, verse 8 and 9, when his family's kidnapped and taken by the Amalekites, who if Saul would have killed, would have never happened, okay? So sometimes the battle God calls you to is to help you to be victorious, to save somebody else some pain, or to save you some pain. But these Amalekites take him off and he turns around and it says, David found strength in the Lord in the darkest hour when he took his wife and kids and everything. He had a root there that when it went south, he had God at the core. He knew he's the one he had to lean on. And he cried out to God. 1 Samuel 23, 10 and 11. 2 Samuel 2, 1 through 2. 1, 1 through 2. 2 Samuel uh, 5, 17 through 21. 2 Samuel 5, 22 and 25. 2 Samuel 21, 1. Those are all things where every one of those before David, not after. See, I'm good at seeking the Lord after. I made a big mess, God. Help me to fix it. <laughs> Lord, I don't know what to do. It's all going south. How many of us consider and ask God's wisdom at the beginning? You're my father. You know what's best for me. Dad, can I get some advice? Will you show me what to do? So the challenge for me is, here's a man who turned around that. James chapter 1, verse 5 says what? If any of you lack wisdom, what are you supposed to do? Ask God, and he goes, liberate all without finding fault. If we could get Proverbs 1, through 23 on here. I think this is interesting too. I find that I serve a father who wants so much to help me not make a train wreck. And you know, it's easy to understand. I love those kids, and I'd do anything to help them not replicate my mistakes. But the, one of the things that's difficult about getting old is you learned a lot and nobody cares. <laughs> and so if you want to make a difference, you younger people, I got news for you. you got, how many people are here over 50? Raise your hand. You got a whole bunch of experience right here. Okay? You got a whole bunch of experience right there. They can save you a lot of pain if you have the humility to ask some good questions. But if you know it all, buckle up, baby, because there's two ways to learn. You can learn from my mistakes or you can make your own. It's up to you. <laughs> but you will learn. And I look what it says here in Proverbs. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent of my rebuke, then I'll pour out my thoughts to you. I'll make it known to my teachings. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then, then... Then you call out, but I won't answer. You looked at me, but you'll not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. God is on standby and promised to give you wisdom. He said, and all the resources are heaven available. There's no conditions on the wisdom. But how many of us can ask him up front, Lord, what do we do? Our eyes are on you. So I look at what he did there. Fourth thing I see is he was a worshiper, and I'm not going to steal much of the thunder here because I know we're going to talk about it. But I just think it's interesting, 1 Samuel 16, 23, that the Spirit of the Lord had departed Saul. There comes a point in there where God gave him over. See, when God would draw something, guess what fills the vacuum? 
So when scripture says it was a spirit of evil from God, it simply means that he would draw his presence and evil took that vacuum. Harvard, Yale, and Princeton at one time were missionary schools. <laughs> and when they threw God out, what sucked up? Yeah. Evil. And the same thing happens, man. You want to get the most evil people, let somebody that once upon a time was godly, and let them turn their back on God, and there's a core there because there's no coming back. They can't be bought to repentance. And so the challenge gets to be, as I look at that, he would play his harp, and then relief would come to Saul. He'd feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. 2 Samuel 6, 20-22 says, And David returned to bless his household. He just got done bringing the ark for the second time because they tried to do it the first time, and they made some shortcuts. The Kohathites were supposed to carry the ark, but they put it on a cart because we all, you know, carrying is a lot of work. <laughs> and so Uzzah got struck dead, and suddenly they thought, note to self, don't mess with God's stuff the way God said not to mess with the stuff. And so David returned home to bless his household. Michael, daughter of Saul, that's his wife, came out to meet him, and she says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants in a vulgar way that any fellow would. And David said to Michael, <laughs> it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or, father or anyone from your house when he appointed me to rule over the people of Israel. I celebrate before the Lord, not become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but if I those slave girls you've spoken of, I'll be held in honor. See, David didn't give a rip. There was an audience of one that was for him. And I'm amazed all the time. We can have football games. We can have basketball games. We can have MMA fights. People can get up and throw potato chips and vegetable dip at each other and go nuts, man. We can all celebrate. Yeah, touchdown. It had nothing to do with you, man. You're just a human being there. But you got the God of the universe who loves you, who gave you everything, who will give it all up for you to give you a foundation. And once you to be victorious and somehow we're freaking out because I want to lift my hands or get on my face. I'm here to tell you, be a worshiper. And they'll talk more about it in the coming days. Worship God. I don't know about you, but the enemy's worked in my head here lately. These stupid phones we have. My attention span is that of a gnat. When I try to have devotions, mind wonder, mind wonder, mind wonder, mind wonder. You know how to get that back? Put the earphones in, plug on some worship music. That's how I get my head right to listen to God. Yeah. I sit there and I'll go through some worship music and next thing you know I enter in and that's all I think about. Suddenly I'm there. I can pray in between songs. I can pray with the music down low. I can turn around and start turning my heart and spiritual things. Because guess what? Worship kicks the devil's butt. And I wish I had more time to tell you. It has Susie some time about her time. She was almost dead one time. That girl's almost died on me a couple times. And she had her appendix burst. And two weeks later, she had a tummy ache. And she decided, <laughs> this is two weeks after a burst. She's taking ibuprofen because she's got a real high pain tolerance. And here, her whole innards are full of pus. And the doctor says she's a miracle girl. You know? She should have been dead. But her body built an abscess around it. <laughs> She lived some kind of miraculous way. But one of those times, she had toxic shock syndrome. It was 16 days in intensive care one other time. And in the middle of that whole thing, she had this face like this death mask. She, I mean, she looked bad. And she went out in the car and started worshiping God. And suddenly, God said, because you did, I'm changing it all. And he bought her totally back just because she turned around and worshiped him in the storm. Once again, you've heard me say this, and I'll say it a thousand more times. Children of Israel up against the Red Sea. It's looking bad. The Egyptians are coming at high speed, Okay. Oh my goodness, did God just bring us out here to kill us? And all of a sudden, Moses, the man of faith, lift his staff, and suddenly the sea parts, and get on the other side, and Miriam and, and Aaron have this big praise and worship session, you know? And I'll never forget David Wilkerson saying that was the right song, that was the wrong side. You want to honor God in the middle of your trial, you worship him. In the middle of your hardship, you worship him. In the middle of your darkest hour, you can put a pure praise up to heaven, it will kick in the gates of hell. I've got it right sometimes, sometimes I haven't, but I'm here to tell you it works. And so when we look at this whole thing, Psalm 86, verse 12 says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, I will glorify your name forever. With all my heart, not half-hearted, not whatever, it's like reckless abandon. I have so much to be grateful for. 
For although they knew God, they neither glorify him as God nor give thanks, and their foolish hearts were darkened. When they turned around and worshiped God with their lives, and when they lived in a certain way to glorify God, and when they started being grateful, and they started recounting all the things God had done for them, they kept their minds sane. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you're going to keep your mind sane, you thank God for it. You may be going through a trial or tribulation, but you turn around and put it in context. Guess what? (laughs) My family's still alive, and I live in America, and I have food to eat, and I have a nice vehicle to drive, and I have a car, and I have a wife or a husband that loves me, and I got kids that are not dealing with some kind of bad thing. And you know what? I'm going to that stuff, and sure, I got this, but I also got a lot of this stuff. I got a lot of stuff, and so this is it. So God, I thank you. In the same way you made a way that you're going to make a way, and I thank you for all of it, and that's how you stay sane. Number five, he was generous and would not offer anything that cost him nothing. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 26, he gave away the Amalekite plunder. 2 Samuel 4, 4, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's lame son, who was crippled, he took him under his wing because he was generous and bought him at his table. 2 Samuel 6, verse 19, he, had, he gave bread, dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the crowd who in the middle of worship. David was generous. 2 Samuel 24, 24, he, he, uh, when Aruna was going to, he, he needed his uh, vineyard. He was going to give it to him. He said, no. He said, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to my God any bird offerings that cost me nothing. He was willing to give the things that cost him something. And so one of the ways we do is we honor God by what? Hebrews 13, 16. Hebrews 13, 16. We, we had the little kids. That was when they were little kids. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. That was Susie's jingle. Jingle, she used to do jingles for all the kids. And so we, uh, at one time when we had sanity, we were memorizing a verse a day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and you can't lose. I'm just telling you, if you're a young person here, make yourself memorize scripture. It will serve you the rest of your life. I'm just telling you, I've never seen anything like it. God's given me a repertory of scripture and I can machine gun it out and man, it's powerful. It's, just, it's live and active. So you look at this whole thing and you know, we got, you know, we got, we got a lot of extensions here of love in the community, you know? And are we generous towards God? Are we generous towards others? Number six, he was loyal. I look at loyalty and what does that mean? He's faithful to one's sovereign government or state, a loyal subject, faithful one's oath, commitments or obligations. It meant what? If my word was so- said something, it is something. And my allegiance is somebody, I stick with them. And you see that in 1 Samuel 27 where Achish, son of Gath, or the king of Gath, this is the Philistines. Gath is where Goliath came from. So David's so persecuted, he goes to the enemy camp because it's the only place to get a rest. But when he goes there, he goes to the king of Gath and he makes an allegiance with him and he's going he's gonna to go to battle with him. I look at that, whoever David, David wasn't in it for Republicans, Democrats, David was in for principal. He was in it to say, you know what? I'll go into battle with you if you want me to. And they said, no. And the question gets to be, are we loyal to God? Are we loyal to our spouse? Are we loyal to our employer? Are we loyal to our word? If you want God's favor, be loyal. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that's an evil one. A good name's worth more than pure gold. Why? Because it's living a consistent example of integrity. And last but not least, but I think is the greatest... As he took fearless ownership of his sins, he repented and was broken and surrendered to God. If I could list one thing that I really believe touched David's heart more than anything is the fact that he took ownership. He's out with Bathsheba, right? And he sees somebody on the rooftop and does his thing and she gets pregnant and all this stuff happens and then Nathan comes to him to rebuke him and he tells him a story and he said, that guy deserves to die and he said, you're that guy. Does he come out and say, well, but, or something else? No, he says, I've sinned against the Lord. No commentary, nothing. No excuses. It was a bad day. <laughs> he just took fearless ownership of it. And you don't see him doing it again. See, the thing I love about David is he blew it like every one of us do, but he didn't do it again. He learned, he grew. He took fearless ownership. I've sinned against the Lord. Look at Isaiah 57. I'm sorry, um, 51, 1 through 17. This is a familiar, Chris touched on this, but I want to hit a couple different angles here. Isaiah, or Isaiah, I said Isaiah, Psalm. That's why she's looking at me crazy. <laughs> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blow out my transgressions. Notice what he's doing. He's out there and saying, God, I'm not arguing with you what your standard is. 
I'm asking for your mercy because I blew it. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He ain't out there saying it. God, I thank you that I'm better than the dude down the road. Next one. For I know my transgressions and my sin are always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you're right with your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. This is a revelation. It's a revelation what he's made of. Do you know that your righteousness is like filthy rags to the Lord? Are you guys aware of that? Your best day, but we, we see we play outside head games. We say, I thank you that my sin is not like so-and-so. And when I take this pure bottle of water here and I put a speck of dirt in, is it pure anymore? No. Does it matter if I put a whole bucket in it? See, we like to do that, but we're dealing with the holy God here. He's absolutely morally pure. And my one dirt bag speck person versus my whole whatever is inadequate because it's a compromise of who he is. And the beautiful thing about it, he says, I'll make a way. I'm going to take my son and I'm going to make a way. But you better own up to your stuff. You better come before me because if you ever lied and made you a liar, if you ever stolen and made you a thief, if you ever looked for a woman lustfully, you committed adultery, and you're going to stand before a holy God someday. And he loves you enough to try to warn you that you better wake up and smell the roses because you're either going to let him pay for your sins or someone else pay for it, like you. <laughs> and so when I look at this whole thing, it says, yet yeah, uh, you, you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. I can't even clean myself off. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. See, we all have a conscience. I remember hearing Josh McDowell say, what about the innocent pygmies in Africa? Is God going to hold them accountable? He said, yeah, they are, because there is no innocent pygmies in Africa. Because it says in Romans chapter 1, that they have a con- or chapter 2, it says they have a conscience. And their conscience condemns them. You guys remember that? You remember the first time you lied seriously or stole something or something else? You ever something inside bugging you? And the reason our current dilemma in the culture is trying to normalize it is because their conscience is eating them alive. And the only way they can feel like they can put up with it is put out the, put out the standard that holds them accountable. Yeah. See, the law is for lawbreakers, not for those who are saved. If I want to do over 55, I'm concerned about the law. If I never do over 55, I don't care. And so when we look at this, it's important. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart. God, I don't even have a pure heart. I need you to create one of me. Please create in me a pure heart, Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain you. Notice his dependency. His part is to take ownership and God's part is to produce. But he realized he has a need, and because of that, he waits on the Lord to give it to him. Then I would teach transgressors your ways. Why? Because I'm a fellow recipient of your grace, that sinners may turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, and God my Savior, my tongue will sing in your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You did not delight in sacrifice or I'd bring it. You did not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Your sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. What does contrite mean? Contrite means I saw myself as I really am before a loving God who's been so good to me. And I realize that I, I need mercy. God, please forgive me for the hurt I've caused to humanity. Forgive me for the selfish acts I've done to exploit others. Break my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Break my heart, O oh God, and make it more like you. Isaiah 66, 2, we're wrapping up here, so don't fall asleep on me. Has not my hand made all things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who humble and uh, contrite in spirit who tremble at my word. God is simply asking you and me to deal honestly with our condition and to quit the flowery surface stuff that looks good to the rest of the world and to let him do a deep dive in your heart to help you to see the areas of your life that are inconsistent with your claim to be a Christian and to invite him because he loves you to make you something so you can live an example to a broken world that needs you like never before in the history of mankind. 
We're in a dark time in history, but if you let God do that, you will shine like stars in the dark universe. And you will be a contrast where people come and it says, then you can be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. They're going to be asking questions because of your example. I love uh, Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. When I let God do a deep dive in my life, then wonderful things happen. Look at the next one, Isaiah 57, verse 15. Two more scriptures and we're done. And this is what the high and exalted one says. If you guys could come up here on stage, that'd be great. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. If you want to bring heaven to earth, take your dead wood, put it on a pile, and invite God to light it up. And I'm here to tell you right now, America needs you. Your family needs you. Your employers need you. Your work needs you. It needs you to show what it looks like to let him come in and bring life abundantly to flow through, overflowing in your life. You know, I just look at what God says, you know, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope and that by the power of the Holy Spirit. That when we look upon a hopeless world out there that's totally broken, The solution is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The solution is you doing honest business with God and saying, Lord, I may put a higher higher value on those flowery outside things when downside you need to do a deep dive. You need to rekindle my desire to look for the gold and silver and costly stones. You need to rekindle my desire to let you have my life completely in all. You may do that because you know what? He wants to work in your life. And what I love about David is he had integrity. That's a word we don't talk about much anymore. A consistency. He was behind closed doors when he was in public. He was working underground as much as he was above ground. It was something that he was consistent. There was a congruity there. And because of that, this is what God said, or David said to God, he said, I know you're pleased with me in Isaiah, or I'm sorry, uh, Psalm 41, verse 11, 12. He said, I know you're pleased with me, for my enemies do not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, uphold me and set me in your presence forevermore. I'm here to tell you right now, you don't get any defeat if you're going to let God work in your life with integrity. You don't get any defeat if you're going to be a moral consistency. You don't get any defeat if you turn around and do these same things. If you turn around and and, uh, honor those that God put over you and submit yourself to authority and be a blessing to your boss, to be a blessing to your father or your mother, to be a blessing to those in your life that God's put over you. You're not going to be a, you worry about this if you embrace the hardships of life and praise him on this side of the Red Sea and say, Lord, I trust you. If you seek the Lord for every decision, he's going to lead you in wisdom. He's going to help you to know the way. If you're a worshiper of God and you can worship him on this side of the Red Sea and let him work in your life, then guess what? He's going to make a way through the impossible. If you're generous and you give God everything and you give your brothers and sisters and meet their needs the best of your ability, And last but not least, if you take fearless ownership of your sins, if you repent and surrender. Because I told you this story, and to me it's a beautiful illustration once again, but I love it. Because I work in the police world, and I tell cops all the time, I say, you're sitting there in a school zone, and all of a sudden somebody blows through the intersection at 90 mile an hour, almost hits the little kid crossing across the street. As a good cop, are you going to let him go? No, you pull him over. But when you pull them over, are you just going to let them go with a ticket? No, they almost killed somebody. So you arrest them. You impound their car. And then the day comes for a court. And the judge is there, and this young lady whom this happened to comes before the judge. And the judge says, how do you plead? And she said, guilty, your, your honor. She took ownership of it. And she told him, sir, I don't know, but I, I'm guilty. I have nothing to say, but I'm guilty. And I ask for your mercy. And then he looks at her record, and he sees that she has no priors. This is her first offense in this particular case. But being a just judge, he can't let this go, and so he finds her 586 bucks, gives her a 30-day suspended sentence. And then he turns around and sends her to community service. 
And then he does something weird. He comes off the bench, takes his robe off, whips out his wallet, and he takes out the money, and he paid the fine. You know why? That was his daughter. As a loving, as, as an honest judge, he had the exact judgment. As a loving father, he paid the price. And that's the message of what Christ did. If you're here today and you have, you're out there and you've just ran from God all your life, maybe he spared your life sometime. But I've had to come to him as a lion thief and adulterer and say, living God, forgive me. I don't want to be like that anymore. I want you to work in my life. I want to be an authentic Christian. And so if you're here today, number one, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you. We're going to add a in here. God says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you for the Father. And what does that mean? That means I'm walking this way, partying, having a good time, doing whatever I'm doing in a rebellion to God. And he says, no, I need to take ownership. Turn around. Walk away from it. Let me teach you how to be the person I meant you to be. Because if you don't, you're walking off a cliff to eternal damnation. But if you let me work in your life, I love you. And I'm going to give you a season here where I can work in your life and encourage you. But if you want to be remain stiff-necked, someday it's not going to work out well. So if you haven't given your life to Christ yet, I encourage you to come down here. We're going to have people. If there's something that you've been flowery on the outside, but down inside where you haven't been authentic as a believer, and one of those things that I've talked about today, that you need God to get a hold of you and to work, then I invite you to come up for prayer because this is all about us humbling ourselves before God. He will lift us up and he loves you with the passion, but he's not gonna put up with your nonsense. So we're gonna open the altar here in a second. I'm gonna say a prayer and I just wanna thank you guys. I love you. I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I'm here to tell you as a former partier who went out and slept with 15 million people, it seems like it was dumber than rocks, drank my face off and everything else, that God can have mercy on you. And he can take you as a broke, hurt kid with so much pain. He can gently give you life. He can pick you up. He can give you gifts and he can put people in your life to teach you and make something your life. He put you here for a season and you're going to waste your life if you just keep doing it your way. So Lord, I come before you and I ask for your help, Lord. God, would you work on hearts and minds to bring life, Lord? And would you bring encouragement? God, help us to all deal honestly with our sin. And I come before you and I just confess my mouth. My mouth is my strength. My mouth is my weakness. And you call me to lead an international organization. And it's easy for me to run my mouth about hurts or stuff that was legitimately done to me. And I got to quit doing that, Lord. And so please forgive me. God, I ask you to help me to rise to the occasion because I don't see how you're going to do it. Because I know what I'm made out of. And uh, I need you. I need you in a mighty way. And God, would you move in the hearts here to open our eyes to see our need? And we just thank you in Jesus' name.